Hi, my name is Gary Hawkins, and this video is on exploring photometry. So, by way of introduction, I'm going to assume that you are familiar with the concepts and terms relating to photometry. Uh, this video is not about what photometry is, it's about how you undertake photometry and photometric analysis. I'll begin with a few opening remarks and a brief introduction to the equipment and software that I use for photometry. We will then step through the collection of data for a variable star using my measurement equipment. And finally, we will walk through the post-processing and basic analysis of this data. My primary goal of this video is to show you that photometric measurements are well within the grasp of the average amateur astronomer. I've been doing astronomy for about four years. I started doing visual astronomy with a very basic um, push dot, an Orion XT8, that we took out into the desert while we were camping. My interest in astronomy rapidly progressed into electronically assisted astronomy, more commonly known as EAA, to combat the light pollution that I had at my home location at that time, which was in the northern part of the city of San Diego in California. And also, uh, EAA was an ideal platform uh, to undertake public outreach, which I did through the San Diego Astronomy Association. With the onset of COVID, face-to-face um, -face outreach became impractical. And so then I went online with an SDAA colleague to do EAA live streaming, primarily through YouTube. An exoplanet course earlier this year made me realize that my EAA rig was actually also extremely suitable for photometry and for the use within citizen science projects. As eclipsing binaries are much easier targets than exoplanets, that's where I started. I'm a member of the San Diego Astronomy Association, and in particular, I take part in the Outreach Special Interest Group. I also work closely with the Boyce Astro Foundation, which is where I did my exoplanet course, and timeanddate.com, where we primarily do live streaming associated around lunar eclipses. My EAA photometry setup is a fairly cheap and cheerful setup. It's based around a 1988 Celestron C. H. Schmidt-Cassegrain telescope. Most of my gear is secondhand, and this particular OTA in this particular configuration has a field of view of approximately 30 seconds by 30 seconds. Uh, and the reason I mention that is it will become apparent a little later in the video. I had to uh, make a very few hardware changes to my EAA setup to make it suitable to, for photometry. Um, and the primary one was the replacement of the light pollution filter that I was using for EAA with a UVIR cut filter to constrain the response of the 533MC color CMOS camera that I was using to a spectral range between 400 to 700 nanometers. My EAA setup, software setup is shown in blue and it's based around SharpCat Pro, which is one of several extremely well-known packages used for electronically assisted astronomy. My mount is a EQ6R by Skywatcher and so I use the EQMod EQTOR software, which is a public domain software to control the mount. I use the cart to seal sky map. And for guiding, I use the very popular PHD2 software speed. For EAA live streaming, I use OBS Studio, which 
usually goes out to YouTube. And sometimes I will combine that with uh, Zoom, uh, which I'm actually using to help put this particular production together today. In order to do photometry, I need to basically add just two pieces of software. Uh, the first of those is AIJ, which is the software tool that I use to do differential photometry. And the second tool is a tool called Dimension 4 that ensures that my clock PC is always synchronized uh, to the uh, time standards that are widely available on the World Wide Web. So I have accurate time measurements and accurate time measurements are critical for biometric measurement. All of the programs that I'm using are open source, except for SharpCat Pro. Other tools that I use while doing photometry include those available through the AAVSO. In particular, I use the Variable Star Index, VSX, and the Pick a Star Portal. I strongly recommend, if you're interested in photometry, that you become a member of the AAVSO. This allows you to submit results through the web ops application. And perhaps most importantly, it also allows you to get an AAVSO mentor. And I found that my mentor has been particularly helpful in uh, helping me develop my photometry skills. In addition to the tools available at the AAVSO, I also use the Aladdin Sky Atlas along with another program called Star Alt that shows me the elevation of my target star on my observing evening. And one of the reasons you want to know that is simply because you don't really want to be doing photometric measurements below about 30 degrees in elevation. The other thing I would say about photometry is don't be afraid of your location. Uh, even if you're located in um, heavily light polluted skies, it is possible to actually do some good photometric measurements. And I have done photometric measurements from my old QTH, which is uh, indicated by the red arrow, my current um, uh, home location, which is indicated by the orange arrow. Um, and I've also done um, photometric measurements from the San Diego Astronomy Association dark sky site uh, towards the Mexican border indicated by the blue arrow. The majority of my measurements have actually been done at the old home location um, in Boral 8 skies. So don't be afraid of your location. You'll be able to get good photometric measurements um, as long as you follow the correct procedures. I think with photometry, the thing that I think the key thing is workflow. I think it's uh, if you define a workflow that works for you and you consistently use that workflow, you're going to have success uh, because you will do everything the same every time that you do it. I actually use the sequence function within uh, SharpCat Pro to walk me through the acquisition, post-processing, and differential photometry process, but you could just as easily use a spreadsheet. You'll find that your equipment has an operational sweet spot. I mentioned the field of view of my equipment earlier on, 30 seconds by 30 seconds. Um, this gives me an operational sweet spot of 10th to 13th magnitude targets with exposures in the range of about 20 to 60 seconds. You don't want to go below 20 seconds as you will see scintillation effects in your results. And if you go much above 60 seconds, your guiding has got to be working uh, fairly well. I do all of my image acquisition using SharpCap. I do my post-processing using the ASTAP tool that I mentioned earlier on. I use this for both plate solving that ensures that each image has its uh, WCS coordinates placed in its FITS header. And I also use ASTAP to extract either the red, green, or blue channel for photometric analysis. I typically extract the uh, green uh, channel uh, since this will give you results that approximate very closely 
to using a Johnson V filter with a uh, monochrome CMOS or CCD camera. And I do all my photometric analysis using the uh, tool Astro Image J, uh, which was initially designed for exoplanets, but is a very good tool for uh, standard differential photo photometry. So in a few moments, we're going to look at the measurement and analysis of the variable star V576 Peg. This variable star is in the constellation of Pegasus. It's a eclipsing binary type EW spectral class K4. And it has a magnitude range of between 11.2 to 11.8. This has a fairly quick period of about 0 0.26 days, just over six hours. So in several evenings, you can get the complete light curve for this particular variable. On the right hand side of the image here, you see a finder chart that was obtained from the AABSO. The target star is in the center. One of the interesting things is that the AAVSO only identified one comparison star within the field of view of my telescope. Uh, this is going to be a problem for differential photometry for two reasons. One, the identified comparison star is, through, is two, or, two to three orders of magnitude less than the target star. And secondly, you need more than one comparison star, ideally. So we're going to be uh, randomly selecting comparison stars, um, as you'll see in the later part of this video. This is my target star viewed in the Aladdin light package. Uh, the star is in the center of the uh, display there. Um, and you'll see within Aladdin, it's actually identified by its more typical um, designator RX J2311.0 plus 2142. So now it's time for some measurements. Okay, so uh, we are now at the point of doing some measurements. It's about six hours uh, after I recorded the first segment. I am located on the patio of my home in Blossom Valley, California, with my telescope next to me. Uh, the telescope has been set up and polar aligned, and it, the, all the hardware is connected, the cameras are talking, um, and the uh, sky map is connected to the telescope. The telescope is currently pointing in the approximate direction of Polaris. As I said to you earlier, workflow is critical. So I am going to use a sequence that I've developed. So I got to my sequencer and I'm going to run image variable star. And I am now gonna get a number of dialog boxes come up, which I am gonna to respond to. And this will walk me through the process of getting everything set up so that I am imaging my star in the right fashion. So the first thing it asks me is, have I determined the variable star location? I have. Uh, do I have my UVIR cut filter in place? Uh, I do. I have the uh, fourth position on the filter wheel selected, which is the UVIR cut filter. Is the dew shield in place and are the heaters enabled? Um, and that might seem a rather uh, rudimentary um, thing to check, but it's, it's, it's a little embarrassing if you get into a photometry run and find that either you've got to put the dew shield on or the dew heaters are not working properly and um, uh, everything's beginning to dew up. If I check the uh, Pegasus Astro power box here. I can see that my temperature is uh, my nighttime temperature and the dew point are almost coinciding and it's a very damp evening here already with 98% humidity. 
So the dew heaters are going to be working uh, now to keep both the guide scope and the OTA free from dew. Have I achieved appropriate focus? Yes, I focused the OTA during the telescope setup. Um, focus doesn't have to be precise for photometry. Uh, in fact, soft focus can help a little bit because it spreads the light over a slightly larger radius um, and it stops such a severe peak. Um, and it, one of the things you're trying to avoid in photometry is uh, to saturate the um, is to saturate the uh, camera and having soft focus um, enables or reduces that problem somewhat. Okay, so now it's going to ask me to move on to my target. So I am going to open my sky map. And the name of my target is V576 PEG, which I've loaded in there. So I'm going to press return. That brings the sky map round onto the target. And now I'm going to slew the telescope. And as you can see now, with the white square moving left to right on the sky map, that is my telescope slewing towards my variable star target. And uh, if you're wondering what the noise is in the background, I'm not sure if we're, you're picking that up here, but we're pretty much um, in the country here. Uh, coyotes are a, a fairly regular visitor to the property, and uh, several of the local dogs have heard the coyotes coming in, and uh, they're barking behind me at the moment. So um, that's one of the joys of living in the country, but personally, I like it. Now, um, I do not do a one, two, or three star alignment process uh, with the mount. So we're not going to be accurately positioned at the moment. And what I'm going to do, or you will see that the sequencer is going to ask me to do it in a minute, is do a plate solve in order to correct the position of the mount. So I'm going to go back into uh, sharp cap. And before we do the plate solving, it's going to ask me to load the appropriate camera profile. So that would be 533 MC variable star observation. I'm going to load that. And I'm now going to quickly check down through the camera parameters to make sure everything's OK. Color space is correct. Capture area is correct. I am going to put this onto fits rather than PNG. I'm going to go down through. My cooler is on, but it's set to the incorrect temperature. I need to set it to 5 degrees because that's what I have my dart set for. And I am going to um, actually, while we're waiting for the uh, camera to reach its target temperature of minus 5 degrees, we're going to uh, we're going to load our dark and our flat files. I actually captured these uh, the other night. And I actually like to apply my dark and flats at the time of the image capture rather than do it in post. It's easier. Um, a lot of people do recommend doing this in post, um, and uh, there are various reasons for that. But we this evening are going to be doing it uh, in pre-processing. So I've loaded my camera profile. I'm just going to connect my scope to uh, sharp cap, and I'm getting close to my target temperature here. So I'm going to move on to the next step. I've added my darks and flats. And now we're about to do um, plate solve. And so what's happened is that the gain of the uh, camera has been set high at 550. The exposure has been set to 10 seconds. And I'm being made to wait to ensure that the mount is perfectly stable. And as soon as we get down to zero seconds, a plate solve is going to be initiated. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to take a picture of the sky, compare that to uh, determine where we're pointing, determine where we should be pointing, determine the error, and then correct the position of the OTA accordingly. And that is taking place or will be taking place as soon as we capture the frame. And it looks as though we were actually pretty much pointing in the right direction. So the scope has been prompted to correct itself by just 0 0.2 degrees. And now I'm being asked to wait for the mount to stabilize again. And so we will just need to wait until this gets to 0 seconds again to move to the next stage. OK, so the mount is now stabilized. Um, I actually um, have PHD2 guiding already up and running. So I am going to uh, just clear some things down here. Uh, I am going to, uh, we are connected, we're looping. I'm going to, we're going to select the stars for guiding. And I actually use the multi-star option within PHD2 guiding. So as you can see, multiple stars have been selected. I am going to start to guide. And the guiding software has started. And we appear to be working okay. So I'm going to minimize this. PHD2 guiding is going. And we have come to the end of our sequence to um, get us ready to start image capture. But there's one thing that we do need to do, and that's we need to make sure that the chosen exposure and gain for the imaging which we've initially set to 120 and 60 seconds is um, correct. And if it's not correct, then we will need to adjust the gain of the camera to make sure that we're um, getting about the right peak ADU count for our target star. And typically, uh, since our maximum value is the 16-bit value of 65,000 um, and change, um, I typically will set my um, maximum ADU, um, I want to see something in the order of about 20 to 30,000 uh, peak value. And that will give me some overhead and make sure that if the brightness of the star that I'm imaging increases, I don't drive the camera into saturation. So in order to do that, uh, I am going to take a snapshot image here. And this snapshot image um, will be saved down to the hard drive, and we're going to open it in uh, the AIJ program in a couple of minutes to see what the peak ADU of the target star is. So we just have to wait for the 60 second capture. Okay, that's now completed, and that uh, snapshot image has been saved. So now I need to go look at it. So I am going to open AIJ. And I'm going to make sure that I look at the, that image, which is here. And here is our target star in the center here. And if I mouse over the target star with the aperture, you can see that my peak value is in the order of about 15,000. Now that's, I normally, like I said, try and aim for about 20 to uh, 30,000. So that's maybe a little bit on the low side. I can either increase the gain slightly here, um, which I think I'll do just to get a slightly better signal to noise ratio. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into sharp cap. I'm going to change the gain to 150. And I'm going to take another snapshot. And we will then take a quick look at the, um, the snapshot picture again to look at the PKDU. And hopefully we'll probably run with uh, a gain of 150. 
uh, for this evening's run. So again, we have to wait uh, 60 seconds while we capture this image. And then we can open it up again in a So we're just waiting for that process to complete. And hopefully it will save this frame, although we might have to wait for the next. But we'll see as we get to the end of the account here. And indeed it saved this frame. So I'm going to take this image. I'm going to open this new image up in AIJ, which is this one here. I'm going to do that mouse over again. And you will see this time that the peak ADU value is now about 20,000. So I'm quite happy with that. So it looks as though I'm ready to start the image capture run itself. So I'm going to close down AIJ. I'm going to type in my target name, V576 tag. And since I've already done one capture earlier on this evening that wasn't successful, uh, and now my guider's failed one second, so I'm just going to uh, stop my guider. Not too sure what happened there, but something. For some reason, the guider failed. And it looks as though we've got clouds moving in here, and that may be the issue. So let me start that again. Let me select my targets. Start that guide. Clear these parameters. OK, we're guiding. And now I'm going to start my capture. I'm going to do an unlimited number. And we are now capturing the first of what will hopefully be several hundred frames this evening, each taken on a 60 second exposure. So we'll be taking 60 images per hour of our variable star V576 PEG. It's now time to look at post-processing and analysis in the third part of this video. I'm not too sure if it was picked up on the audio, but at the very end of the second part of the video, where I initiated a measurement run on the variable start V576 PEG, you might have heard that the guider was giving alarm messages. Sadly, I was unable to undertake a full set of measurements that evening, as even though I reset the guider and got the measurement process going again, within 15 to 20 minutes, the clouds had moved in, and consequently, the rest of the evening uh, was not successful. I'm going to be using the sequencer within SharpCap Pro to guide me through the post-processing and analysis phase. I have written a script called Generate Light Curve that will run me through all the steps necessary to get from my raw data through to a processed light curve. Now the screen may get fairly busy at times here and normally I would use the software across two screens as it's somewhat easier. Uh, but for the purposes of this video, I'm going to do it on a single screen. So I start my sequence and the first thing it asks me to do is to install the daily update for Astro Image J to ensure that I'm working with the latest and greatest version of the software. The sequence automatically opens Astro Image J. I go over to Help and Update. And the program now reaches out to the main server. 
and downloads the latest daily build. Now, it's going to, the sequencer is now asking me to go to my raw images and copy those from a science folder to a processing folder. And I'm going to use some data I collected a couple of nights ago uh, for V576PEG. I'm going to open that data up using File Explorer. And here is the raw data that I collected. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a science folder. And I'm going to create a quarantine folder. And then I'm going to create an AIJ processing folder. And I'm going to take all of the raw images that I've collected and I'm going to put these in the science folder. And apart from copying them into the processing folder, these will now remain untouched and get archived in case I need to do later analysis. OK, so they're in the science folder. So I'm now going to copy them again, and I'm going to place them in the processing folder as well. So all of the files have now been copied across to the AIJ processing folder. So I'm going to go back to SharpCap. I've now completed this stage. And it's now going to ask me to open the 146 images and visually inspect them with the AIJ tool and quarantine any bad ones. So let's open AIJ. I select just the first file, press open. And a dialog box will come up and it will show me that I'm about to import 146 images from this run. Okay, so those images are now imported. I'm just going to vary the white and dark levels here so that I can clearly see the stars. And if you remember from our image that we looked at on Aladdin 10 earlier. This is our target star here, uh, V576 peg right in the center of the image. And I'm now just gonna quickly step through these images with the, by moving the cursor across. And you can see that the image is drifting a little, even though we had guiding on. All of the images look pretty similar, particularly if we look at the histogram on the bottom. The histogram is not really changing as we move across. So it looks as though we don't need to quarantine any images. OK, so I've done that process. I don't need to quarantine anything. I can close down AIJ. And now um, the sequencer opens up. ASTAP, which I use for two purposes. The first of those is to do a batch plate solve. And to do that, I'm going to go into Tools, Batch Processing, Batch Solve Images. I am going to go to my data that I'm processing. I'm going to select all of the files which I wish to batch process and open. 
And immediately you'll see that the uh, ASTAP is doing a batch solve of all of those images. And it typically takes about half a second to solve an image. It's one of the reasons I like uh, ASTAP as a tool. The, um, the plate solving is extremely quick. And what's happening here is the image is coming in. Um, its center position is being determined. Um, RA and DEC is being calculated for that. And those coordinates are being written back into the FITS file header for each one of the images. Now, what's interesting is that not all of these images will solve. Um, and that will create a problem. And so we will need to go in and take a look at all of the images and just step through them and make sure that the WCS header has been updated. And if it's not, we will quarantine the images. And one of the reasons that I believe that some of these images won't solve is because if you've got multiple targets or multiple objects moving through your field of view, such as satellites, we have a lot of military traffic here. Um, that can um, upset the plate solver. We will do the next item in our um, sequence that I've written, which is to either do two times two binning reducing the source file from 3008 by 3008 down to uh, 1504 by 1504, or we will extract one of the color pixels. And in fact, we're gonna do the latter. We're gonna extract the green color pixel um, and that will automatically reduce um, the resolution down to 1504 by 1504. So having done the batch plate solve, I'm now going to extract the green color pixel. And to do that, I go into tools, batch processing, raw color separation, and I am going to pick the one, two pixel, which is one of the two green pixels. And it's going to ask me which images I want to process. And it's now going through, ASTAP is now going through and selecting the one, two green pixel and creating a new image file that we'll see in a few moments. Again, this takes about half a second per image. So we have about a minute to wait now as this, this processes. I typically select the green channel um, because green channel results obtained with a color CMOS camera are actually very accurate or very similar to um, results that you achieve with a monochrome camera and a Johnson V filter. Um, but I could have just as easily selected um, the blue channel or the red channel if I was interested in uh, looking at the data in that part of the spectrum. And I've done my batch plate solve. I've also done my color extraction. So now I go back into the file explorer and you will see now that I have got two file types of file here. I've got the raw file that was plate solved and then I've got the extracted P12 file, which of course is also plate solved, but is considerably smaller uh, because it's only a 1504 by 1504 image compared to 3008 by 3008 for the 533MC color camera that I'm using. So I'm now just going to order these files according to size, and I'm going to select the larger ones. I'm going to delete them. And this is why we do all of our work in a separate file outside the science folder. Because if you were working in the science folder and you did this deletion and it was by mistake, 
you might have a problem recovering the files. But by having a science folder, which has got your original files, in, you can always go back to those files if any of the data is corrupted during the processing of it. I'm going to delete those. And now I've got 146 images that are all 1504 by 1504. Okay, so now the sequencer opens up AIJ and I am going to import the green channel images in 146 of them. And you can see that the first uh, image, which is what we'd hoped for, has got the RA and DEC coordinates written in the FITS header. And as I mentioned earlier, if the plate solver failed to plate solve, these RA and DEC will be empty. So we need to go through and we need to see if there are any files for which the plate solving failed. We're going to just have to do this manually using the arrow key. I'm going to step through each one of the files. Just make sure. Ah, there we go. There's one. So uh, we need to remove image 44. OK, so we've just found the one image that did not solve 44. So we're going to go into the File Explorer again. We are going to go to our images that we're working on. We're going to go to image 44. I am going to cut that image out and I am going to paste it into the quarantine section. Okay, so we are going to now um, re import the file um, because I need. We need to make sure that that import doesn't contain the raw file, including the, um, the one that's got the missing WCS coordinates. Okay, and we're going to import 145 images this time. Okay. And just quickly scanning through again. Everything looks like it's okay. We still do have this issue where, as you can see, over time, our target star is moving across the image. But we're going to sort that sort that out next. So now in the sequencer, my next step is to align the images using either the WCS coordinates or uh, by placing an aperture over the target star. And I'm actually going to align using the WCS coordinates, which is why it's important to make sure that I've got no files with missing WCS coordinates, because at that point, AIJ will actually stop processing the images. So going back in, here are all my images. I've got 145. I'm going to go into. Um, where am I going to go here? I need to process a line stack using WCS or apertures. I've got my 145 images. I'm going to use the RA and DEC to locate. I am going to use only the WCS uh, coordinates within the header for the alignment. I'm going to have these checked and I am going to press OK. And AIJ now is going through the process of aligning all of the images using the information in the FITS header.
Okay, great. We have done that. And AIJ has now written these aligned images to a subdirectory uh, called aligned. So these are the images that we were working on. As you can see, these are the unaligned images. And in a minute, we'll look at the aligned images. So we've gone through that, we're gonna press OK. Now it's gonna ask us to, within AIJ, import the aligned data. So I'm gonna go back into AIJ, I'm gonna do file, import, image sequence, and here is that subdirectory called align. And I'm gonna select the first image, 145 images. And as you can see now, when I move across all of the images, the target star now stays stationary because we've aligned the images according to the WCS coordinates within the FITS. Okay, so we've essentially now finished the post-processing activities using ASTAP and AIJ. We're now going to actually generate a light curve. And to do that, we're going to use a function within AIJ called the DP or data processing. And I'm going to go into the DP. And running the DP will open two windows. The first window is this one. And the important things here are to make sure that our observatory location is correct, along with the altitude of the observatory, and that our target star is selected here. And as you can see, it's already populated with V576 peg. And that will ensure that when we do such things as air mass calculation, etc etc that all the information that we get is correct so this window is okay i'm then going to go into the second window and now i have to make sure that i process the right data and as you can see at the moment this is the data for the 14th of september we were working on the data for the 15th of september so i'm looking at the wrong data at the so I'm going to go into the folder option. I'm going to go to um, my working folder. I'm going to go to my working folder, which is this one. And I'm in the right folder, but now and now I've got to set up the um, file name here with appropriately positioned wildcards to ensure that I bring in all the files that I'm trying to get. So if I make that modification and have the wildcard here, you can now see the 145 images that I want to process that have appeared here. Um, if you were doing dark frame, uh, bias frame, flat frame uh, correction of the image, this is the point that you would do it in post-processing. But as if you remember from segment two of this video, we actually did that uh, during the image capture process. So I don't need to do anything here. I will then go down just check what else we have here. We are not going to save any calibrated images. Um, we are just going to go through the generation of the measurement file. Now you can do the generation of the measurement file and also do the plot at this point, but I find it's better to just generate the measurement file and then uh, initiate the plotting function. So we're going to have this box checked and this one unchecked, and we're going to click start. 
All right, and the first thing uh, that's going to happen is uh, that we're going to need to place our apertures on our target star and comparison star. Um, these figures, these numbers here, um, correspond to the aperture, the size of the ring, and the outer size of the annulus that allows us to look at the background. And I had prior to starting the video, or this started recording this part of the video, checked one of the science files to make sure that this is the these are the appropriate numbers. And I am going to um, place my apertures with these checkboxes checked. So here is my field of view. Here is my target star. So this is going to be the first star that I select, and that's going to be labeled T1. And all of the remaining stars that I now select are going to be my comparison stars. And I always select seven comparison stars so that I'm looking at eight stars in total. And I'm just going to look around here. I've got a number of stars here. I'm just mousing over them to check the peak value is not saturated. Um, and I can see that I've got some good targets here. This one up here, this this star is saturated. You can see the peak value is at 65,535. So this would not be a star that you would wish to select as a comparison star. So I'm going to pick now uh, a random selection of seven comparison stars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So in total, I have selected eight stars. And these are going to be the ones that we're going to do differential photometry using. We're going to be using the comparison stars to do differential photometry on the target star T1. OK, so with my apertures placed, I'm going to hit return. And we are now generating the results for each one of the images, image is that we collected. So 145 images, and we're stepping through those. Uh, we can actually see the air mass column here. You can see that the star was rising in the sky um, as the air mass number is getting lower over the period of these measurements. Okay, great. So we've done that. So we are going to minimize that. And we're going to go back into our sequencer. So I've run the image through the data processor. And now I am going to plot that data. So I go back into AIJ. And I select the plot button. And at this point, a whole sequence of windows is going to open on my screen. Uh, this can be a little intimidating for the first time AIJ user, as um, there's a lot of information in each one of the windows that's open. But I am just going to step you through the open windows. And to do that, I'm going to minimize some of these windows so that we can bring them up individually. So we're going to go in and we're going to look at a couple of these plot files. Uh, the first one is the multi-plot file. And within the multi-plot file, um, I want to make sure that I've got the name of my target written in correctly. I want to put a subtitle in, which is for the green pixel. I want an auto range, which I've done here. And uh, that all looks pretty good. And then I'm going to open up another. 
This window is interesting. This window tells us for the measurements that we're doing, which of the comparison stars we're using. And at the moment, we're using all of the comparison stars, C1 through to C8. Now, that may not be a good choice, uh, depending upon the quality of the comparison star. So the next thing I'm going to do is go into my multiplot Y window. And essentially, this is a pre set up template and I'm going to do plot the relative flux of the target star and the comparison stars and I'm going to do that in such a way that I can look at the data um, and quickly determine if my comparison stars are good quality um, and you can set up templates for uh, what you want to plot um, what color your lines want to be, whether you want to put lines on, whether you want to just put dots on, whether you want to smooth the lines, etc., etc. And you do this all within the multiplot Y window. And so that brings us to our final window, which you actually got a glimpse of a couple of minutes ago, which is the plot window. And I am now going to. A look at the uh, this window and I can tell you straight away again it's kind of a little difficult dealing with just the amount of limited space that we've got here I can tell you that we've got this is our target star the 576 peg and as you can see we've caught it uh, when we did this measurement run, we caught it pretty much at the peak of its light curve. Um, it then faded um, approximately 0.6 of a magnitude, uh, went through a minima, and then came out on the other side. And I've, I've got multiple comp stars here. Uh, you can see the first couple. Comp star 2 is actually very stable. Comp star, the second comp star is, is not quite so stable, but it's pretty decent. And here is the final plot of the light curve that I collected on the evening of the 15th of September for the 576 peg. This is a relative flux curve, um, but by selecting the right checkboxes, I could be displaying this in absolute magnitude as well. So that is a quick overview of the post-processing of data associated with the variable star within AIJ, um, or at least the, the processing of that data. We did the post-processing of the raw images in combination of ASTAP and AIJ. So hopefully you've learned a lot from this video. Um, I will be doing some more detailed uh, videos uh, to look at certain aspects of this, but hopefully this provides a good overview of how we go through the capturing, post-processing and analysis of photometric data for a variable star. Additional information uh, that you might find helpful can be found in the AAVSO observing manuals. There's also the Scientific Amateur Astronomy Forum on cloudy nights where you can get to meet a lot of other citizen, science, uh, citizen scientists who are undertaking photometry. The book, The Sky is Your Laboratory, Advanced Astronomy Projects for Amateurs by Robert Buckham is also an excellent book for learning all about photometry and the different techniques used for it and the different types of measurement that you can understand. The AAVSO also has a very good YouTube channel with lots of videos up there. And of course, in general, there are many YouTube videos, including this one, uh, that you can find uh, that will um, done by similar people to myself who are keen on the hobby on tools like AIJ, ASTAP, etc. Et 
Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, my name, again, is Gary Hawkins. Uh, I'm a member of the San Diego Astronomy Association, and you can find more information about our club at sdaa.org.